let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, so I pr primarily, I'm not a, techno a technical guy. I'm not a, um, in the sort of technology space. I work primarily in service and experience. My role is, uh, what I try and do is I try and write, research, advise, generally cajole organizations into producing better outcomes for both their people and their customers. Um, I do that through various kind of different things. I've written about three books now. The latest one is, oop, this one, it's called Punk CX. Um, it's just come out a couple, of weeks, a couple of weeks ago, and that's the thing I wanted to talk to you about today, because the story behind it, like all great stories, starts with a beer. Primarily, you know, actually my favorite beer, which is Guinness, and it occurred in a pub called The Basket Makers in Brighton. Anybody been to Brighton know The Basket Makers? Clan, well-traveled folk. So anyway, I was there. I um, was speaking to Oshin. I was having a bit of a rant about the state of service and experience at that particular point in time. This was December 2017, because I'd been watching and researching and working with different companies uh, for, for a number of years, and I just was becoming growingly frustrated with the state of progress and the lack of progress. And I was like, Arr! same shit, different days. <laughs> I wish somebody would kind of like change up the rhetoric and do something a bit more punk that would just break the mold. And so that led me to, to think about it, and that sort of idea sat with me for a while, and then I, it reemerged last summer and I started really thinking more deeply about it and I started thinking about it within a musical context. And I started thinking about the evolution of musical genres in and around the punk kind of era. And that made me to, to, to come to prog rock, which is the thing that preceded punk. And I mean, who's familiar with prog rock? Any prog rockers in the, in the room? Come on, admit it. There is no shame in it. A lot of people like prog rock. Prog rock was, was great. You know, despite being um, popular, this is a group called Paladin. They're kind of larging it up. They were supporting Uriah Heep. This is a concert in Berlin, I think, in, in, the, in the 70s. And whilst prog rock was really, um, was really popular, it also got accused of being overly elaborate, um, self-obsessed, generally in danger of disappearing up its own arse, more interested in itself than other people. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. And then it made me think about service and experience, and I was thinking, hmm, the customer experience space, I think, are dis displaying some of the same sort of characteristics as Prog Rock did in the 1970s. You know, I was thinking about this idea that I think we're in danger, my space is in danger of becoming overly complicated, overly technical, overly framework, overly benchmarked, Certified, codified, professionalized, functionalized, yada, 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 yada. It's becoming more interested in itself than outcomes, customers, and people. Um, and here's, you familiar with this slide? This is from last year. My case in point, ladies and gentlemen. Complicated. It's even, the news is even worse because actually there's various research reports that suggest that 70, between 70 and 80% of all large customer experience or experience-based initiatives fail to meet their uh, expectations and or their objectives. They're just not doing the right things. So I was thinking, oh, I'm frustrated. Then I, was, then I started to go back and think about the, um, the music side of things, and I thought, well, if customer experience and my space is starting to look a bit like prog rock, then what happened if you go back to prog rock? And this happened. <laughs> Punk rock exploded out the, back of, uh, out the back of prog rock with its DIY, back to basics, all heart, emotion, mindset, daring to be different approach. Who's a punk rocker in the room? Any punk rockers? Brilliant. Who, who would like to be a punk rocker? <laughs> Come on. So, as I say, it's, it, punk rock was a back to, basics, uh, back to basics approach. It was a reset. It changed the world. Um, and this was the sort of attitude it had, because it dared to be different. 
I've been doing this um, recently, and this is the fun part, if you'll indulge me for a second. I would like you, as a way to make this whole thing, the punk thing, a bit more visceral, is to, you can do either a one-handed or a two-handed approach. I want you to get your best punk face on, <laughs> right? And you go one-handed or two-handed. I want the whole room, you can either stand up, sit down, but I want basically everybody to do to get your punk on, and I'm going to take a picture. It's going to be a famous picture. It's going to be API Days Amsterdam. Get your punk, get your, get your punk on. Ready? After, after three. Right, three. Get your hands up. Come on. Get your twos out. Three, two. Well, I have to go back a little bit further. Get you all in. Three, two, one. Ready? Yeah. Right. Let me just do one more because I want to try and see if I do a selfie. Ready? One, two, three. Ready? Right. It's an experiment because actually, if we start to feel it, if we start to feel like going, fuck you, then we kind of we start building that bravery inside ourselves because actually, this is what the world needs. This is what our industry needs. This is what our customers and our employees and our partners and our suppliers. This is what we all need. It's what we all want. We want people to do something different. But it doesn't mean you have to have a Mohican. <laughs> Punk is a, is a mindset, it's just a thing that you, just kind of, it's, you can exploit. You don't have to be, um, be different. Let me prove it, to, prove it to you. Who knows this song? Teenage Kicks by the Undertones. Uh, the old punk rockers, there you go. All I have to do is point to, this is Fergal Sharkey. He was the lead singer of the Undertones. He's wearing a red sweater. He's a boy next door haircut sort of thing. I think that's a granddad shirt, collar shirt he's got on there. Here's another one. The buzzcocks ever fall in love with somebody. He looks like my dad at CNA. The brown striped shirt. So you don't have to have the, the, um, the Mohican to be a punk. You just have to dare to be different. Oof. So let's think about what a punk rock version of CX would look like. Because I think punk and I've been asking different people, is it comes up with different words to describe what a punk attitude to the customer experience would look like. This is uh, a list I started kind of crowdsourcing. My favorite is the one, it's with the asterisk in the second column, revolutional. It's like, let's make up a new word. Revolutional, I love that. But ultimately, I think it's about being different, being willing to stand out, being counterintuitive, being, wanting to do things that are not boring. You know, that, that actually work. Not complicated or simple, but also to make, make mistakes. Because it is an attitude and a mindset, it's not a method. That, the answer is up to you. It's all with you, but it comes from here and here. The heart in the right place. Um, so then that's, so I wrote a book about it. And actually, to try and write a book which was aligned with a punk ethos, I thought, well, I can't write a 50,000 words telling you what punk is all about, because that's not very punk. So I thought, well, actually, can we write a really short one which is really punchy and to the point? So rather than having a table of contents, we've got a track listing. So, oh, so this is like the track listing inside there. So it's, like, it's designed like an album. It's cover, it's almost like a fanzine. So it's got like all sorts of colors in it. It's, it's a, I'm very proud of it. It's a beautiful thing. So, but, Rather than tell you all about it, I thought I'd put a mixtape together for you, if that's okay. Um, and this is a selection of the, of, of the tracks. So the first one is a more of a challenge. And it's called, are you an artist or are you just coloring in? And this is what it looks like inside the book. And the point is, is that if we think of, if we go back to that, um, that 70% or 80% where most initiatives are failing, I think they're failing because they're coloring, they're, they're painting by numbers. They're taking a very, very uh, same old, same old approach, but expecting different kind of results. People are expected to do coloring in and then create art. That doesn't work. To be an artist, you've got to be willing to do things differently. Um, and the question we, we have is like, are you artists? We just talked about, you know, bringing the human back to it. I think we need to be human artists. And that's our challenge. You know, but within all this sort of stuff is like, you, the, the, one of the next tracks is this idea with great power comes great, responsib great responsibility. Anybody know where that quote comes from? Ah, 
Spider-Man. Well, actually, it's not Spider-Man, it's his uncle, Uncle Ben, who is advising him and said, like, you've got great power, and that, with that comes great responsibility. And the same thing applies to technology, and the same thing applies to data and privacy and security and, you know, um, and, and all the other sort of things that we're coming up with, like behavioral science and psychology and all these different things. We have a lot of power, but with, it, with that does come responsibility. I think this is my favorite thing. I have a poster in my, my, in my office, which is customer experience, is more than fucking metrics, it really is. But the, one of the challenges is that when we talk to people about customer experience, one of the first things they go, oh, our, our NPS score is this. You're like, that's ridiculous. We have to not be so reductive in how we think about things. It's not just about the numbers. If I ask you the difference, what is the difference between customer experience and the customer's experience? It's a country mile. Technically, it's four letters and an apostrophe. But actually, in reality, it's huge because our customers get lost in this. Let me show you, the, let me start painting a picture of possibility. This is a picture of a, a, a building society called the Coventry Building Society in the UK. Now, they're not necessarily the most well-known financial services organization, but they are the most successful in terms of how fast they've grown over the last sort of 10, 15 years. They grew at double digit growth, uh, double digits per year before the financial crisis, through the financial crisis, and since the financial crisis. They have the best customer numbers, they have the best employee engagement numbers of any financial service organization in the whole of the UK. And here's the trick. They abandoned all sales targets nine years ago. They have no targets, they have no metrics for the people on the ground. And they are the best in class. Because they are focused on getting their people to do the right things for the right reasons at the right times. Again, it's the art of the possible. Does that make sense? Related to the, um, the, the power and responsibility is that this idea about we're, we're trying to make everything kind of really personalized, but actually, you know, customers say that they want it, marketeers want to deliver it because they know it enhances the customer experience, but then people like Forrester talk about this personalization paradox where they say, that, well, people want it, but they're also fearful for the data and security. It's, more, it's even more complicated when you, when you actually ask marketeers, when, they, when, they ask them, when you ask them about, just because you can do it, a, you, well, when you're putting in place these personalization kind of strategies, they've asked, they were surveyed and, and about 60% of all marketeers admitted that some of the strategies that they were putting in place were in fact creepy. The idea being just because you can doesn't mean say that you should. So, the challenge for us is that we actually have to, because we have all this kind of power, all this responsibility, we have to also self-regulate. And that can be hard when we're in the thick of things. Let me just get a drink of water. The next thing I wanted to talk about is simplicity. You know, we have a, we have a fascinating ability to complicate things. We find it so easy to keep adding and adding and adding and adding things, but we find it much, much harder to take things away. There is a, there's an agency in New York called Siegel and Gale, and since about 2009, I think for the last 10 years, they've run this thing called the Simplicity Index. If you don't know it, it's pretty easy to find, it's simplicityindex.com, and they have been tracking a basket of brands that represent simplicity-driven businesses, not from the business's perspective, but from customers' perspectives, the customer's perspective. And they do this across the world. It's a global kind of uh, ongoing survey. And what they've found is that over the last 10 years, those basket of brands that have simplicity at their core have outperformed their respective stock markets but in excess of 300% and all their customer numbers and employee numbers and their revenue numbers and growth numbers are all in the right sort of direction. They just, they're way, way above the market. So the business case is there, but this stuff is hard. We, kind of, we need to almost think about the more that we add, we have to be taking away at a faster rate 
than we're adding. I don't see a lot of that kind of going on, but that's, that, therein lies the challenge. The other kind of challenge, I think, is that we talk about, you know, creating a frictionless experience, but I actually, I don't think frictionless experiences is, are, are all, are something that we, we should automatically um, strive for. I was speaking to a, a guy called Andy McMillan, who is the, the CEO of a, of a company called User Testing. And he told me a story that with a client that they were working with that they were, they were online, um, this was part of their shopping kind of like cart journey. And they, were, they were, did all this analysis and they said, oh, they're taking too much time in the shopping cart. And therefore, we're gonna try to do a lot of work and try and smooth out and quicken up the, uh, the, the, the shopping experience. When they, when they did that, the thing that they found out was that their conversion rate went up, but their uh, customer lifetime value went down and their, and their propensity to repeat purchase kind of went down. And the reason why that happened is because what, because what they, didn't, they didn't realize, they didn't realize that actually the putting together of the basket of goods and services was the thing that created the value in the mind of the customer. I think that's a fascinating kind of insight because actually what we can do when we get it in industry and in service and ex particularly in service and experience, there's a lot of these memes that, ri that, that rise up that says, oh, frictionless is, all, is, is, is the thing. We have to do this. My challenge to you as punks, I hope, is to challenge some of that thinking, to say, hmm, maybe not all friction is bad. Maybe some friction is good. And where, where's the, where do we need to put good friction and where do we need to get rid of the bad friction? It's all about challenging. And it's also, also about kind of doing things kind of differently. This is the next, the next one I want to share with you. Called, when was the last time you went to the Gemba? Anybody know Japanese? Somebody, please tell me that's right. Apparently it is. I always want to check if there's any, is there any Japanese speakers? Good, I could, just, I could be saying anything. Um, but the, the, uh, the idea about when the last time you went to the Gemba is, um, this is an idea that comes from, it's been around for ages, it comes from Toyota and Taiichi Ono from the, um, the, the, back in Toyota in the 1950s when they talked about the way they, they properly grew to understand the work that they did is that they, their managers in Toyota routinely went and walked the floor. They walked the floor not to tell what to do but to learn and understand and to help. Now, in a very much, a, that's becomes, that can become very much more difficult today, particularly when you're working remotely or virtually or it's in a, in a digital kind of context. But it doesn't mean to say that you shouldn't do it. In a digital context, this is how you can, this is how you can do it. I mean, I was speaking to, I spoke to uh, Andrew Lawson, who is the chief product officer of Zopa, which is a peer-to-peer, -peer, large peer-to-peer -peer lender in, um, in the UK and soon to become bank as well, they're building a bank. And because they're all online and it's all digital, the way that they bring the Gemba to life, as it were, is that they asked some of their customers to actually come into their offices to do some real transactions. And they did it in front of them and they can put their people, whether product designers, uh, marketeers, engineers, developers, all these different, different people behind a one-way mirror. So they watch them doing real stuff. Can you imagine what fingernails down a chalkboard kind of sounds like and feels like? That was the experience, what it was like for the folks at Zopa watching their actual customers do, trying to do some work. Particularly if you're a designer or an engineer who built something and they're trying to look around, trying to find something, and you're like, it's over there. It's really simple. But in reality, it's not. But you don't get those sort of insights unless you're actually trying to create those kind of more visceral occasions. That can be harder, that can be quite hard sometimes, but actually the challenge is, is like, how do you bring yourself to become, get closer to the customers, to really, really see it from their perspective? Do you need to sit next to them? Do you need to invite them into your offices? Do you need to try and employ some virtual, um, sort of almost like watching software so you understand how, what their experience is? But the best companies do bring, try and bring their customers um, closer to them. It, and if that means they have to kind of travel to them, then so be it. 
but it's the challenge. Let us get out from behind our screens, our dashboards, our Excel spreadsheets, our analytics suites, all of these different sort of things, and actually become more human. And we do that by connecting with each other, by spending time with each other, by listening, by seeing, by understanding. I think we also kind of, in order to do that as well, I think that we talk about building agile and adaptive organizations. We talk about um, trying to do things sort of differently, trying to learn and develop as we, as we go. I actually, the, my, my challenge with that is that I wonder how reflective we are actually really being. Are we talking about stuff or are we talking about ourselves? This is one of my favorite pictures. It, I found it in Brighton. It was painted, a piece of graffiti that was painted on the side of a telephone cabinet in the middle of Brighton. It says, dude, sucking at something is the first step towards being kind of, sort of good at something. And I wonder, how often do we ask ourselves, when was the last time we sucked at something? When was the last time we sucked at being a boss, a colleague, a peer, a customer, a supplier, a human being. You know, because if we want to get better, if we want to become more human, if we want to be kind of, we want to do better for our, our, our businesses and our customers and employees, then we have to become more reflective. We have to become more honest around being, when was the last time we sucked at something? So, who sucked at something already this morning? There you go. Uh, keep your hands up. Let's, let's, let's kind of go like, who sucked at something yesterday evening? I'll put my hand up for that. Sucked yesterday during the day, last week? Everybody kind of hands should be going up at this point. Otherwise, you're all superstars. My point is, is that we can talk about being agile. We can talk about trying things and making mistakes, but I actually think we have to take that agile mindset and apply it to ourselves, to our own hearts and our own minds, because that's the thing that's gonna help us get better. That's the crucial input that goes into the, the, the businesses that we're, that, that, that we're building. So when Luis and Rob and Leila asked me to come and, and talk, to, um, talk to you today, I was thinking I was a bit worried. I must admit, because this is like a technology conference, a technology and entrepreneurial conference, and I'm not really that sort of guy. But they said, actually, we, what you want you to do is to actually amplify the human part and set the tone, because, and actually maybe act as a bit of a counterbalance and be on the side of the employee and the customer. And this is one other track, is the answers are right in front of you. And I wanted just to share a story with you that comes from Lloyds Bank that a friend of mine told me about when they were re-engineering or redesigning their personal mortgage business. And when they were doing that, they were like, right, we're gonna make this better, we're gonna take out all the friction by identifying all the problems. And they thought, well, they, th they thought, how are we gonna identify the problems? And they were like going, ah, data. And then analytics. So they got this big team and they rolled them in. They gathered all the data. And then they went away and hid in a darkened room for about six weeks. But then one bright spark in, 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 um, in Lloyd's when I tell you what, I'm just going to go down to the contact center and I'm going to gather up about eight or ten people and I'm going to buy a tray of donuts and teas and coffees. I'm going to take them into a room and have a chat with them for about 30 minutes over lunchtime. I'm going to tell their managers to bugger off so they can speak freely. And in 30 minutes, they came up with a list of the top 10 customer problems to do with their mortgages. Interestingly enough, this data team re-emerged into the light, came back to the business, and presented their findings six weeks later and hundreds of hours and thousands and thousands of pounds and euros kind of later, only to prove that the agents were 80% correct. So the question has to be, are you willing to go and talk to people because the answers are right in front of you. They have these supercomputers, they're called brains, 
Or are you, are you, want, are you wanting, are, do you want to spend six weeks and thousands and thousands of pounds and euros and dollars? Do you want to get started? Again, that's the thing. It's like, just because you can use this stuff doesn't mean to say that you, that you should. Sometimes the easiest solution, the quickest solution is right in front of your face. Next thing is because the next thing is that I, it's about checking your assumptions. There is a one of my favourite quotes comes from Alan Alda, who is um, do you know Alan Alda, the kind of American actor out of Mash, tall surgeon, yeah. So he has he was given an, uh, an address at his um, daughter's college, and he was he this quote was in the the the, the address is your assumptions are your windows on the world scrub them off every once in a while or the light won't come in and i think assumptions are fascinating things and they change depending on who we are and where we are and what sort of context we're talking about a friend of mine told me a story about when they went to he went to finland and they were walking around um, they went to visit this school they were walking around the school. And down the corridor, there was these two young children in the corridor. And he was like, the asset headmaster, he says, like, mm, why are those two young boys sitting in the, um, in the corridor? What have they done wrong? And he says, ha ha, they've done nothing wrong. And he's like, well, that's weird. Because in the UK, when you do something wrong, you get excluded from the classroom and get sent sit outside. And he said, well, actually, no, that's kind of not, not the way that we work in here. He said, those two boys know that they, when they're working on maths problems, they like to work together. And working together requires that they want to draw and they want to chat and they want to and argue, kind of actually, and almost wrestle over the problem. Now, to have them in class would be disruptive for the class, so we put them outside. They choose to be outside. An assumption. We think outside, some people will think outside means excluded and done wrong, but actually in that system, it's not. It's completely the opposite. You know, we make assumptions like people won't pay for better service, we make us, which is wrong. We make assumptions like all millennials don't want to talk to people, they only want to use self service kind of tools, wrong. You know, we make assumptions that old people aren't digitally savvy. Again, wrong. We need to check our assumptions. If we want to deliver a better service, a better experience, we need to check our assumptions. Our assumptions are, our th are the things that get us into the most trouble. Are, are the things that underpin all of the mistakes that we make. That's not, a bit, not an invite for everybody. <laughs> But we can, if you like. Um, this comes from, uh, this, the next track, it comes from a gentleman by the name of Tom Peters. Um, who knows Tom Peters? He's a brilliant guy. I, I've met him once, spoke to him um, a couple of times. He's brilliant. He's becoming more shouty the older he gets, which is kind of quite nice. It's kind of close to my heart. Um, but he said a, a really beautiful thing in his latest book called The, uh, the Excellence Dividend. He, talked about this idea that when people in organizations, they want people to be more innovative and more collaborative, that they start to they resort to software platforms, whether it's a Slack or a Yammer or kind of whatever it might be. But the challenge with, with all of that is that they, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't address the core, and the, the core central problem is the relationship issue. There's no point putting these platforms in place if you have no relationships no emotional connections, no that, that musculature that you need to create a really um, thriving, uh, connected, adaptive, learning, innovative organization. So he said, he made a suggestion. He said, imagine this, just for, imagine the possibilities. Imagine you're in an organization and say you're working, say 200 days a year, Monday to Friday, let's say. Imagine if you took 40% of those days, so two days a week, and on two, on two days a week that you went and had lunch in your organization with somebody that you didn't know. 
Imagine how many more connections that you would make. Because we all know when something goes wrong, yeah, we might want to message somebody, but actually when something really goes wrong, what happens? We pick up the phone, right? And we look for people to really help us, people to really step up. Emails are easy to, you know, to ignore, as any other kind of message is easy to ignore, but sometimes you either go and visit somebody or you pick up the phone. That's what I'm challenging you to do, is to build those connections, both with your colleagues, your peers, your customers, all these different things, but some, that requires spending time with them. It's the greatest gift that we can give ourselves and give each other, is spending time with each other. Ooh. Technology. So, I've just, I just wanted to share with you a few ideas from the book. It is intentionally meant to be a very colorful, a very visual, quite profane, a little bit shouty, punch in the face. Because I think that's what the industry needs, not necessarily the punch in the face, but like a wake up call. I'm not that violent, really. Um, But it's an invitation. It's an invitation to, to step up, to do things a little bit differently, to do things that matter to both our people and our customers and our communities. So my question is to you is, who's ready to embrace their inner punk? Doesn't have to be for everybody, that's the thing. This is kind of like, this, this is like a, you self-select here. But given that, shall we get started?